and we're in and welcome to the Good Listening To podcast with me, Chris Grimes. And I'm very, very excited to be welcoming Michelle Matheson to the Good Listening To podcast clearing. <laughs> now, Michelle, I, I saw something on Facebook this morning. Apparently, friends shouldn't tell friends that 1980 was 40 years ago. Oh, oh, that's, that's put you off. Yeah, so, that's kind of scary. Well, we, but luckily for both of us, we don't go back quite that far. But we do, uh, sorry to tell you, go back to 1982 because Michelle Matheson, we trained, as you know, I know you know this, but I'm just doing this for the benefit of the listeners, which is just you and me, probably. But um, we trained together at the Central School of Screech and Trauma. Da, 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 da. <laughs> the Royal, 82 to 86. Royal School now, the Royal School of Central School. Yep. No, yes, yes, the Royal School. And by the way, you haven't got a gong, have you? Because th there was something alongside your name and I thought, is that a gong? Have you been given a gong a gong a gong no uh, one of our counterpart there's there's caroline allen has been given a gong uh and we were talking about that last time i saw you at the um the hospital uh, club no as i well. haven't been given a gong yet yet i say yet yes let's all say yet that's good so <laughs> uh, welcome the good listening to podcast i'm going to curate you through the clearing which is where all good questions come to be asked and all good stories come to be told and i'm delighted to speak to you you are um, a tv wonder woman you've recently been given in your illustrious career and experience um you're doing a job share as bbc creative diversity partner oh, yeah. at the bbc and also you've been all about diversity and inclusion because I know in, in your career, I think you started round about the time I was going off to the Bristol Big Theatre School after our central school teaching degree. Uh, I think you started in BBC radio drama, didn't you? I did. Well, I started in schools radio, actually. That's uh -huh. how I got the job as a producer um, because I had been a teacher and um, had worked in youth theatre and understood stuff. And because I was a teacher, I was so organised that when I went into my interview with all my packs individual packs for every person on the panel I think they were a bit impressed so um and that and the smile and that sort of confidence that you get from central yeah I got the gig I was I was chuffed to bits I like that so information packs is the way to go is it so you, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> as, as possible blind them with science and by the way you, you were always uh, good anyway because you also could do karate so if they did <laughs> for you you could you could give them a, a sort of chop in the right place as well I'm assuming as well Yes. I mean, karate was, um, it was a, it was something that I think I did throughout Central actually. And um, yeah, and I, I did really well. I got through to quite a high level and, um, and competitions and stuff. So um, yeah, that kept me going. I think I had so many other things outside of Central when I was there, but at the same time I was, I really loved, I mean, you rem remember it was just one of those places where you love going up the steps in the morning and just thinking, yes, yeah, I'm really here. Um, which was great. So um, that's not left me. So it's been yeah, it was a good experience. Yeah, there's always a wistful feeling on the tube on the Jubilee line going past Swiss Cottage. I, you know, I'll never lose that sort of frisson of excitement of ooh, the Royals. <laughs> and we called it the Central School of Screech and Trauma as well. I can't know if you remember that too. But it's the Royal Trauma now as well. <laughs> So uh, welcome to the Good Listening To podcast clearing. I'm going to take you through the lovely storytelling metaphors as we go through a storytelling journey to get your to your thinking to unfold. So Michelle Matheson, um, what's your story of the day? How's morale? You talked about having had your jab yesterday. So, so how are you? What's your story of the day? Well, the story of the day is that I've survived. I'm here. Um, I had the jab yesterday, which was really strange because my partner He's older than me, has asthma and is a teacher and he hasn't been called to have his jab. And I was called without any underlying health conditions and absolutely tickety-boo. So for me, it was a bit, oh, OK, but I'm just going to go and have it. So I did. And she was swift. That needle went in and out. And I went, oh, is that it? And she said, yes, oh, great. So I came out thinking now I'm vaccinated against coronavirus, part one anyway. Um, I think it's been a really weird year for for everyone and and I think when you're working from home or whether you're looking after your children or whether you're looking after you know your parents or elderly relatives it's been a really it's a strange time it's not been a nice time but at some point at some point it's been a really good time to connect and yes to closer to the people that you're with and to really start appreciating life a bit so I think having that jab was a bit more of um appreciating what I have I'm wanting to sort of stay with it for a bit longer, really. 
Yes, yeah, so it's been a real um, sort of calling of our presence, if you like, about what's important and where our presence is most required, I think. Yeah, it's been absolutely. absolutely. A very compassionate and empathic time for everyone concerned as well. So um, that's your story of the day. So uh, first of all, we're going to bring you into a clearing. So what is a clearing like for you? Where does Michelle Matheson go to get clutter free, inspirational and able to think? I like to be outside actually. I know mean, it's, you know, I don't mind whether it's a beach or a park or somewhere. I'm a, I'm a bit of a, as my family call me, a bit of a gypsy. I, I love to walk around with no shoes on, doesn't matter whether it's gravel or sand or grass. And just being a little bit in tune with nature is a really nice, you know, just watching, even if you're just in your garden and you're watching that sort of wildlife that never used to be there be there now it's sort of so I find when I'm in that sort of space that I can really sort of let go of the day and just kind of concentrate on me it's a bit sort of a little bit um meditation but again it's a little bit of um of just just sort of un, un, unfurling all your thoughts and rationalizing things it's really hard sometimes you go to bed with um angst and worries and and uh, there comes a point in the night when you have to sleep and then you wake up in the morning, you think, what on earth was I angsting about before I went to bed? It's just one of those things. So yeah. I find that having that little bit of release or um, especially being outside for me is important. And I think, again, with with lockdown, it's meant that you value it more. You value that little bit of time that you have to yourself and you value being able to go outside and just breathe and just be still for a moment. So I do appreciate that. So I think that's my kind of clearing when I can sort of sit and recount my thoughts, make plans without it being too muddled. I also really like the idea that you're grounded with your shoes off. So there's feet connecting to the ground. And in yeah. fact, being grounded is, is a really uh, good thing to sum you up in what I've observed uh, about you over the last 30 years of sort of being associated and alongside you. Because I think you have a really good grounding in everything you do. And uh, people around you always say that you are the, an anchor person and you're grounded. And you've often, you know, in, in your job with my first job in TV, it's all about getting people equipped and ready from the ground up to get yeah. involved in a very exciting career. So there's just something really nice about you and the word grounded. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. I mean, I think it's important to understand where you are in the world in the sense of where your place is. And it's also good to understand your, what, what opportunities are out there and to make the most of them. But like I say, sometimes it's just a case of taking everything in, not panicking and just kind of trying to sort of filter out the noise to make those sorts of right decisions. And I think with um, uh, like my first job in TV, which I took on a couple of years ago, um, the young people that come through there are wanting to embark on their first, their first job or their first career and, um, it's it's nice to sort of be able to help and shape and move people into um, their careers. It's, it works really well. But again, um, I think that it's about showing people I can't give you the job, but I can give you the tools or I can give you the, the direction or the opportunity. And I think for me growing up, that's always been a case, making the most of that opportunity and not sort of going along with the flow where everyone's going, oh, you can't do that, that's not possible, but just mm -hmm. going for it anyway. And I think I've always been a bit like that. Um, I mean, to get to, for me now to get a job in lockdown, which is the BBC going back full circle, um, it's really strange to be there and not actually have been into the BBC at all, not been to my desk, not even got my pass because um you know i've managed to sort of make the most of an opportunity and and i think that that's something that i think will stay with me for life well it kind of is life now isn't it yeah. <laughs> 30 years and your new role coming full circle as you said back to the bbc where you started you've, you've come full circle and it's again it's very grounded because it's about diversity and inclusivity and and giving new opportunities and fresh opportunities to people is what i understood the role to be no absolutely and i think that's come from I think when I was at Central, um, it was, you know, it was it was a, a an amazing institution, but at the same time, there was a sort of very classist model within Central that I think we were all aware of. Um, I think that I wouldn't want to say it was racism or anything like that. But I know that I was very pro 
diversity even then with the plays that I did, with the texts that I used, um, with the with the the projects that I studied or the people that I studied. I was very much always grounded, had a very strong sense of self, which is, you know, and remained so through my time at Central, probably got stronger. Um, um, and then when I went into teaching, you know, um, I was teaching in a school in the East End, a secondary school in the East End of London, Bethnal Green, Bethnal Green. Um, and I taught there for four years and I think Again, you know, with all my own background plus my training at Central, I think it was really beneficial for those young people that I was teaching because I was very much understood where they were coming from and yet wanted to ensure that they understood what opportunity looked like as opposed to sort of just accepting the yes. fact that this is what you're supposed to be. So I suppose my time at Central really was you know, to find out about myself. And I think what I found out most was I was really strong. I think I was really strong in character. Um, I wasn't bullish or or um, uh, came across as someone who would take over. I think it was very much that I had a real solid sense of who I was. So I felt I didn't, I didn't need to become somebody else, I think. Even yeah. though sometimes it would have been easier, he thinks. Yeah, so uh, from the get-go, very authentic, very clear of your own purpose and place, and and, and how you could help. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that was I think that's true. I mean, it probably comes from just how I was brought up, and um, and I think there was a time when we were at Central, and I think that we were in a class with Alan Alkins. Was it Alan Alkins? Yes. Talking about class and social class, and I remember. You know, we, we had a real mixture in our in our year group. Um, you know, from those very very posh and privileged to those sort of much more working <laughs> class and you know down to it. It was a real mix, and that, and that's what I loved about it. And that's what I loved about our course in particular. Um, and I think it's really important that where you go anywhere, there's a mix because I don't like it when it's just one. I do like a, a good mix. But um, we were in a class and we were talking about social class. And I remember they had sort of, you know, white male at the very top, white male middle class and black female working class at the bottom. And I do remember a couple of the girls saying, oh, yes, and absolutely. And in, in such and such a country, they're really late. And, blah, blah, blah. and I just listened. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I listened and I thought, mm. and then I said, OK, and I put my hand up. And um, and it's always a bit scary when you you raise your head above above you know because I could have just shut up and sat at the back sort of thing and I just said you know you went to this particular school or this particular ladies college or this particular um, very expensive school and yet I went to a comprehensive school and yet we are sat here in the same class. By the way, I remember ex I, I remember exactly who you're talking about and I remember exactly <laughs> the lecture. So. Wonderful. Uh, but, you know, I think the thing is, is that it wasn't a case that that and this is the thing that I think for me, it wasn't a case of me thinking, oh, my God, they don't understand this. So it was a case of me understanding that when you haven't had um, any kind of challenges or you haven't understood, you just it's not I'm not going to blame you for not understanding. How could yes. you possibly know about me or my background? You don't. You just have to accept that people have prejudices that may have come from their parents or their grandparents and when they're when they're when their eyes are opened it changes things and I think yes. and I hope that my time there I mean we had lovely Jo Aylip bless her who's who's passed away since but Jo at our graduation ran up to my mum and said in a very Jo way oh I love Michelle I love Michelle she's she's the only black person I know <laughs> And, and it was just so funny because my mum just went, oh, that's really nice for you. I mean, she was just like, I just said, no, mum, because you know what? It's not that she was, she was genuine in her love of the fact that she, this is, this is for her was a new thing, which is kind of a strange one. But, but um, I think just, I just think over the years, we all got to know each other. We all got to understand things. We were all in awe of people who were very, very incredibly rich and in awe of people who were incredibly talented. Mm. Um and I think that our gear group, 
um, even though we might not have kept in regular contact over the years, we've had a number of our own reunions, haven't we? We have, and you've been a real anchor of that in terms of grounding again, full circle, because, you know, it was, you were the sort of conduit. I know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Jed, who was, you know, Jed Stevenson, who was... Yes. Uh, lifelong friend for me obviously he was yes. best man at my wedding all that shablang you know he and you both got it together and we've done yeah. I think three year reunions so yeah. far and it's been they've been wonderful it's been really nice to see everybody and um and I just think that that's really that just stands the test of time that you know yes. you're with a group that um shaped we all shaped each other's experiences and look and outlook on the world and i think that that's really important because we were quite open to that and i think that's partly again being at central partly being on the course we were on because yes as much as we weren't on the acting course we were on the degree course where you ended up with something you walked out the door with a piece of paper to say hey i can i can work which was i think probably one of the best things because we got yes. everything else and i'm so I, 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 you know, I, I do sort of every experience, every friendship, every um, connection, I do value. And I think that that's, again, part of how I've grown up. We've had my, my own, my mum was, um, she was somebody who was kind of what people say born before her time. So from a Caribbean immigrant family in the sense of coming to, to England to do the sort of, you know, coming to help the NHS, she lasted about a year. She couldn't bear it because that's not what she thought she should be doing. She should be working in London being, you know, you know, becoming famous. And that was her kind of thing. So I think I always had that little, little plus for my mum. You're using the name. past tense, I noticed as well, Michelle. So yeah, she passed away when... Oh, just literally probably a year after we graduated. Wow, gosh, yeah. I hadn't realised it was yeah. so long ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's quite a long time ago now, over 30 years. And she, um, but she was very much a sort of, um, she she understood, she, un she, she'd never put any barriers in front of me and my brothers. She was very supportive, whatever we wanted to do. Um, we didn't have to go into the typical, you know, go and work in a bank or go and work. She was very much sort of whatever you want to do, you can do. If you want to be an actress, go for it. If you want to go to Central, go for it. I mean, the day I got into Central, she was in the bathroom and I, I just burst in because I had that letter, that letter that said, you have got in. I have and a piece of paper. <laughs> I have a piece of paper again. You see that? There's a theme there. Um, yes. I have a piece of paper that says I can come in. And I think it was... She was so overjoyed. She was going around, because we lived in Peterborough then, saying, oh, my daughter's got into Central School Speech and Drama. Oh, my daughter's got into Central School. I mean, because most people say, don't go to drama school. You know, go and do law. Yeah. That's what I was going to do initially. Go and do law. And she was just over the moon, because I think I was realising part of a dream that she'd had for herself. So it's it was, it was um, you know, she was very, but like I say, the way that we were brought up, my stepfather is Swedish and my, 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 my brother is half Swedish and um, we would go to Sweden regularly, they would come here, so we had a different outlook on life. We lived on a, on a, in a council estate in Croydon, um, which was a very white working class council estate, housing, not, not high rises or anything, but the people that sort of salt of the earth type people, the, yeah. you, you know, hard, you know, core values of working hard and 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 you know doing your best kind of thing so I guess you're slightly ahead of the curve because what i'm going to get into am I? i'm so you. sorry chris because no, um <laughs> Uh, and by the way, I loved just coming full circle about Central. It was such a brilliant sort of genesis of an emotionally intelligent journey for us all in our very disparate ways. Mm -hmm. You know, there are 18 of us from, as you said, incredibly diverse backgrounds. And of course, you were you were the only, you know, black face within the 18 of us. So, of course, that must have come with its own, you know, diversity challenge and inclusivity challenge, which has set you on a beautiful path for where you are now, even. Yeah, I don't I think at the time. I was so used to it. I was so used to being the only, only black person. I mean, when I went for my audition, Buki Armstrong was singing around Central and it looked like something of the set of fame. And I thought, oh my God, I want to come here. I, mean, um, yes, Buki Armstrong, I, I think, I think as far as, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it was, and it was difficult sometimes to navigate your, your blackness without people trying to make you be like everybody else and not recognize that so I kind of kept a I think a quite a good balance of understand like I said again of understanding who who I was and who I am to um 
trying to trying to as 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 suppose soak up as much as possible and the way that things are and the way that people are so yeah I think it's um it was like I said it was a it was a good experience not always a not always a good experience as in you know what we're talking about you know the one black face but um I could have easily been that one black face who didn't care about being black if that makes sense yeah 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 and I, I think I didn't I think I always had a sense of who I was and by the way, that allows me beautifully to just mention the word grounded again, because there's just something lovely about you being barefoot, grounded. And <laughs> within your clearing now, you, I'm going to arrive with a tree to begin to shake your tree within the clearing where you're there barefoot, which is such a lovely image, really connected to what's going on around you. A true sense of who you are, what you're here to, to bring, which is going to be a beautiful segue to the alchemy and gold that we're going to later on. So within the clearing now. Um, we're going to shake your tree to see which apples fall out. And th this can get you back into talking about your mum, obviously, if you want to or whatever else. But it, this is the storytelling exercise now where we're going to talk about uh, five, four, three, two, one, where you've had five minutes or as long as you've needed before we spoke today, Michelle Matheson, to think about four things that have shaped you, three things that inspire you, two things that never fail to grab your attention. Oh, squirrels borrowed from the film <laughs> up and then one quirky or unusual fact about you that we also couldn't know about you so this is your tree to shake now just take us on the open road of, of how you'd like to interpret that so four things that have shaped you shaped me. and you're in, you're inferring lots of them anyway so don't worry about repetition but... well i think i've mentioned my mother i think that i think she was a massive influence she was a massive influence because she was like i say ahead of her time she collected art she painted she painted walls she she made over furniture um she she always thought it was important for us to go out every weekend um we we went on our first package holiday when i was nine years old which was unheard of it was unheard of to go on a package holiday everybody went down a caravan or they went on their camper vans or whatever but we went on a plane to Mallorca. Get you. And that was, and so what I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we, I always felt that we were sort of one step ahead of everybody else, even though it was my mum and my two brothers, you know, we didn't have dad. So it was my mum and my two brothers the whole time. And we were looked on as a bit of an anomaly because she was black, she was very glamorous, and she spoke really posh. She spoke, she spoke. So my friends were just, how come your mum speaks so posh? I'm like, I don't know. And as soon as I got home, I said, oh, I don't know why they keep asking me. So I'd have to change. I'd have to switch my, my you know, the way that I spoke because she wouldn't have any kind of a slang talking when I was in the house. <laughs> it was, yeah. So anyway, she was very, um, she was, she was really loving, um, really bright. And I think I just, you know, miss her terribly even now. Um by the way, you're being very moving about her because I can, I, honestly, I'm not just blowing smoke at you. I can just tell what a sort of matriarch your career has been and how proud of you she would be. Yeah. yeah. She came to, luckily, she came to our graduation. So you remember it was um, Tom Conti. He gave us the the old, um, gave us our, our certificates. Actually, it was Tom Stoppard. Sorry to be Stoppard, pedantic. Stoppard, sorry. Conti came to me when I, well, not came to me, sorry. <laughs> like a vision. Was somebody I spoke to when I was doing radio drama, but Tom Stoppard, beg your pardon. So it was Tom Stoppard and my mum came to the graduation and she was as proud, as proud as punch. So I think, I think in a way she died maybe, maybe a year or 18 months later. So, so for me, it was really important that she got to see that milestone and on what I, you know, what I was beginning to become, if you know what I mean. And presumably this was very unexpected. It was just, it, what happened yeah. to your mum? Yeah, she had cancer and it was very aggressive. And uh -huh. um, yeah, she, and yeah, it was, it was so quick. It was so quick that by the time we, she said, you must go and talk to my doctors. They said, your mother has two weeks to live. And that was <sighs> just the most sort of it's grief. I mean, she lived for three. So once the two weeks of thought, I thought, oh, they, forgot, they got that completely wrong. Um, but yeah, it was it was tough. It was really tough. And I just, I think, it must have been about two years after Central because I, I think I just had Pascal when she was she was three months. So yeah, it was it was quite tough. So that's my that's one. Um, other number two out of my shaping and my children. Um, my children have been um, 
a real sort of inspiration, especially now that they're older. But when they were young, I mean, they were sort of, Pascal kept me going after my mother died because she was, you know, a baby, she needed to have her mama. Um, my daughter, Rachel, um, came along two years later and um, again, another joy. And then like 13 years later came along my son, which was a bit of a blooming surprise, mm. but again, a lovely one. Um, so, so the three children I'm really, really proud of. Um, my eldest is working in investment. I'm, 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 I'm making an assumption here. I'm talking about two fathers here. Is that correct for your three children? Yeah, yeah. My, I was married. I was married to, to Michael and had Pascal and Rachel. And then I was with Lorne, which is um, Emil's father, for about 11 years. And I had, mm. I had, had, had Emil. Um, so yes, I've, I've, you know, it's, it's not been easy when you split up and break up from, from partners, especially when you want that happy ever after, but sometimes that's what it has to be. And, um, and I think also, I don't necessarily fit into sort of a stereotype. So my, I think sometimes it, it's a difficult one for, for some men, not all, but for some men to, you know, they want to rather keep you contained and it's very difficult because I can't be contained really in that way. I have to sort of be allowed to do what I need to do. Um, and there has to be a form of trust. So, but yeah. you know, um, yeah, anyway, it's, it's fine. I mean, my girls are, are lovely. I also have a granddaughter and she is five and she's gorgeous. Um, so I'm, you know, my, my children, my youngest is at university and he's doing quantity surveying, but he's also a, um, you know, potential footballer. So he's been doing that alongside, but obviously with COVID, it's all kind of gone sort of to the wayside for a moment, but he is training and stuff. So like I say, and my eldest, she's just bought her own um, place in London and she's um, working in the city and yeah, and, and engaged. So I'm very, I'm very proud of my three kids. I think um, there's a little bit of me in them but I think there's also this bit that I think I'm in admiration of. You know, when you sort of yeah, look yeah. at your children and you think, how did that happen? Yeah, yeah. You get that kind of personality. So you see a little bit of yourself or your partner or your wife, or your husband, but there is something about them, them themselves, which is kind of unique. And that's what I always marvel at. So takes your breath away and is awe inspiring. Absolutely. Oh, that's really, really. Yeah. That's that. Um, and then I suppose. By the way, family is such a core there of what you've just described yeah yeah, yeah, yeah obviously absolutely, absolutely um i think what shapes me um i suppose my my roots have shaped me my my elder family have shaped me so my roots um my mum was from jamaica um and i didn't know my dad so and there was never really speak, only talk about him. So I just- Is he just, still around as far as you know, or is he gone? No idea. Oh, so it's, it's really, you just yeah. don't know. I absolutely have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, um, I, my family in Jamaica, my grand, my grandfather, grand aunts, extended family, we went back quite a lot when I was younger and to get that feeling of where you come from, especially when you're in a country where sometimes when you, when, especially when I was younger, it was I'd go back to your own country and you used to think, I remember going to my mum and saying, oh, somebody said to me, go on, go back to your own country. And I said, oh, pay me then and I'll go back. And my mum just stony face and she just went, this is your country. And I'll never forget that. So it's this sort of feeling of this is my country but where do i come from and it's By the way, that's such a racist stereotype and i'm i'm astounded yeah. that you've actually experienced that bang stereotype you know that's all the time it's not yeah, yeah. It's, you know you do whether it's whether it's in your face or whether it's very subtle yeah so yeah you 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 get that all the time but i think um family understanding where my family who my family were from people who were uh, as your complexion right down to somebody who's ebony black that was my family and when I saw them all in Jamaica and um, and how everybody was and that that warmth and that love and that ease of just being who they are yeah um, and allow you know it was 
yeah, it was a, it was that was quite magical going back to somewhere where your mum would talk about, oh, when I was growing up, it was this, and then actually going to see it. Mm. I suppose it's like anything when we're children and our parents talk about where they're from, and then you actually go to where they were from and yes. see what it was in their eyes. It's always it's always lovely. But I think Jamaica was um, incredibly special. And the first time I went with my mum and my brothers, um, we were. You, you got off the plane and you had to walk through this sort of glass corridor with 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 glass on either side and people staring as you're walking through to pick up your cases, which was really bizarre. Uh, it was Naman Manly Airport. And um, I'm just walking through and- It was like a fishbowl. <laughs> yeah, it really was. And yeah. then and my mum was looking and looking to see who was coming to meet us. And this woman walked straight past my mother straight up to me and she said Mattison you're a Mattison and I said yes and she says where's your mother and I said there and she looked at my mum and said Gloria oh and my mum obviously had changed so much that she didn't recognize her but she recognized it because of me because I looked like my family so I was dead thrilled to know that I, I would actually belong somewhere. So I think that sense of belonging is probably what I'm talking about. What a great gesture to just in, in that one and make you know that you belong where you've come. Yeah, got, absolutely. It? I love that. Yeah. Again, it's grounding. It grounded you. You landed. You grounded. See what I did there? I'm <laughs> glad you did ground. <laughs> um, and then the last one, I suppose, of the four. Oh, yeah. Um, I suppose I would say love and and I mean you know regardless of whether it's relationships or friendships um I think love's so important um <clears throat> and I think that over the years I've I've always had that sort of love of things um I've never stopped being open and maybe my version of love might be slightly different but a sort of um, acceptance of loving being with, um, enjoying being with, um, and getting that sort of special kind of warm glow. And I think that that's been something throughout my life that's really, really important to me. Sometimes it's passion. There are, you know, we can be very passionate. Sometimes it's passion. Um, but a lot of the time it's love. It's love of your fellow man, love of your fellow woman. It's that sort of feeling of, um, being connected and being grounded. <laughs> With a little bit of calm and poise in there as well. And by the way, one thing I, I so remember about you is just the timbre and the sound of your laugh. Over four years, you would hear Michelle Matheson in the corridors. You, <laughs> yeah, you just have a very, um, that's, hello, Michelle, she's coming around the corner. <laughs> Thanks, so, um, we've done beautifully four things that have shaped you. Thank you for that. Now, three things that inspire you. Again, if there's any overlap or resonance, that's completely fine. So we've got four th three things that inspire you now. Oh, um, three things that inspire me. I think I'm, I'm always inspired by stories of people who've achieved throughout, you know, against all odds kind of thing. Um, I like, I like sort of, I like, I, things that inspire me are about people who've achieved and done well, or people who have a really interesting story. I love listening to other people's stories. And when sometimes you get that and you think, oh, that really resonates with me. And, and so that can be sort of inspirational. And throughout my life, I've met people, met, you know been really closely connected and then you drift away and it's not that with that drifting away that you're no you're just you, you've got your elastic band that's just a little bit longer um, yeah. when it comes to people and um and i've always been inspired by um by you know people who have done well i think that's something where um you kind of look at it and think that's that's pretty amazing um so with your love of stories have you ever considered working in television maybe <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think that that's, I think the sort of inspirational things from stories is really important. I think um, music is also important and is, again, is a form of inspiration. And when you hear certain bits of music, whether it's um, 
a, a ballad or whether it's you know a bit of jazz or if it's some kind of jungle or reggae there's something in that that's quite inspirational especially when you listen to lyrics and you think oh that means something to me so I can take inspiration from 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 music um very, much ecle good. very eclectic range there in the types of music that would give you the story <coughs> that you're after it's been eclectic I think um I think it's really I, I think I think I've always been slightly on the outside of everything when it comes musically. Um, I have periods when I'm like, oh, you know, um, don't soul jazz funk. I used to be in jazz funk, you know, Parliament, Funkadelic and that whole kind of range of stuff. But obviously when I got to Central, that just wasn't around. So it would be a case of just trying to pick up the bits that I thought were interesting, like you and Jen, and the guitars and stuff and the singing and all that sort of stuff used to make me, make me laugh, but it's all part of, it, it wasn't me with the guitar that was always no, Jerry. I, I know it wasn't you with the guitar but you you would <laughs> you'd be there chris you'd be there i was there michelle for the four <laughs> years i was there i was watching you i was there <laughs> um i think um yeah music like i say music's been very important to me and it has kind of helped me when you know you listen to a piece of music when you need to have some form of inspiration or you get inspired when you hear an old old classic and you think, oh, you know what, that's made me think of this or that. So it's really about connecting with your feelings when I listen to music. So that's, that's inspirational. And I suppose the third thing of what's inspired me, um, I think it's 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 the it's it's where I've I suppose it's institutions of where I've been and where I've worked. Um, and it's a kind of an unusual one because it's 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 more about establishment, and I and I think it, in establishment, although it's like a dirty word, but actually, it's kind of important. It's important again to <clears throat> see if you can work your way through an establishment, if you can really understand it, if you can take it to task, and if you can be inspired by it, if you can be inspired by the things that you do. So for example, in my current role, um, I'm very inspired by the people I work with mm -hmm. and um, and what they want to do, and what I'm be I want to do and what I've been tasked to do in sort of ensuring that we get sort of diversity and inclusion across all our programs, our content, our program makers. It's really, really important. And so the BBC has inspired me. I mean, you know, it's been part one of those, one of those real solid parts of my life, really. If you can think about that, I went there in 93 to 2013, and then again from last year. It's, it's a lot of my work in life has been there. So I always believe that you have to be somewhere, you have to be inspired by where you are. So when I was teaching, first first um, year when I was teaching, it was one of those things where I see teachers in the staff room, fed up, disillusioned, not interested in the kids whatsoever. And I just thought to myself, if I ever get like yes. that, I have to go. Yeah. I can't. And, and that, again, you know, you it's only because of what you've seen and how how you are and how important you know teaching and being in a school that is inspirational seeing the way that people work seeing the way that kids learn um and the way that teachers work incredibly hard to instill that learning i'm still friends with um young people that i taught who were now in their 40s mm -hmm. i mean that's bizarre isn't it that you can have people come up to you and going hello miss and you just think that's somebody from back in the day um, so I think um, that's, I, I would say, I'm inspired by the places that I've worked. I've been inspired by the people that I've worked with. And sometimes, well, a lot of the time, that's institutions. And I think it's really important to, you know, look at institutions, establishments as, as a form of inspiration. Otherwise, what's the point working there? And to always make sure that you stay passionate and connected as to why you're there is a really good thing as well. Yeah. By the way, similarly, I'm in touch with, uh, I occasionally see people that I used to teach about 40 years ago, but there was a, a I, supply teaching was mostly what I did while I was getting going, going with my acting career. And there was a time when I'd come out of uh, a comedy improvisation show with my company Instant Wit in a pub in Bristol called the Bristol Flyer. And this car screeched to a halt, slightly jacked up with full of big burly blokes. And honestly, I thought I was about to get the shit kicked out of me, but the window came down and they went, all right sir and then they sort of hacked off into the night 
And I was thinking, well, that was good then that they liked me as a teacher. Um, but they yeah, still remembered me. So horribly messy, couldn't it? <laughs> well, did you see what I did? I managed to sort of wrestle with a blind as well there while I was just telling you that story. So um, connection and purpose is good. Can that's, you're, you're beautifully segueing into what's coming next because we're going to talk about alchemy, gold and purpose coming up next. But we now need to think about two things that never fail whoop, to grab your attention. Oh. Flowers. I've become a bit of a gardener. Not as in I wish I was a really good gardener, but I've become to be very appreciative of flowers and birds. I sound like I'm a twitcher, but since this lockdown, or last lockdown, or whenever we locked down, which is like nearly a year now, um, birds have come into my garden. So um, I have a black bird called Roger. Of course you do. How do you know it's called Roger? That's the question on everyone's lips. It just came to me and um, it was just came to me. And, and yeah, if I call him, he'll come. But Roger came with his wife, Lilibet, who was a little bit round and brown. I like um, this. You're, you're actually mad now we're finding out. This is great. I love this <laughs> in a good crazy. way. My children think I'm totally crazy. Apart from my granddaughter, who thinks absolutely. And she'll shout for Roger when she comes in the garden. Lilibet, so, Lilibet and Roger. Lilibet, 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 his wife. And by the way, I've got a cormorant nearby called Colin, so I relate. Thank you. I always knew we related, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Colin so the cormorant. I, I suppose. I suppose what I'm trying to say is what what that's it's a, it's nature. I think nature and that sort of recall of nature where I've not noticed it yes. in a way that apart from the you know foxes making a load of noise at night, I think just just looking at nature, yeah. really looking at nature, really looking at um, uh, everything that's the flor flora and fauna and looking at animals and mm. and I know it sounds kind of a bit like oh is she getting old but um, yeah maybe no it sounds like you're at peace and more present and and again so relatable you know the most profound experience I had during the lockdown was a fledgling bird that hopped out of its nest in our garden and I thought oh shit and um, th it was profound because I think it had been orphaned by a cat bastard nearby wow. and this thing hopped about the garden for a while and I, I felt oh I need to help it and I kept trying not to freak it out and putting it back I was trying to rescue it for hours but in the end Michelle what was so tragic was I my family were really gobsmacked I sat there for an hour and a half with this thing just in my hand because I couldn't do anything for it and it brought back all sorts of memories of you know in Uganda when a, a guinea I don't go around squashing things but a, a guinea pig died in my hand when I was six but oh. this this fledging bird during the lockdown was the most profound thing it was like my presence because why I knew it needed me was because I put it back and then it hopped out again and landed on my foot and was sort of going <laughs> so I picked it up but I, that that nature and you know the best ideas happen outdoors that Nietzsche quote I wasn't telling the bird that but it's just really profound that yeah nature and the fact there are not so many planes in the sky at the moment there's lots of virtues to come out of this oh, yeah um and what was the other one sorry what's the yes sorry we, we divert so you've got yeah. um, roger and lily but you said didn't you yeah, roger and lily but and the whole fauna garden. So got flowers and nature are grabbing your attention and funny enough it's borrowed from the film up oh, oh squirrels so it's not squirrels yeah. but you've got a blackbird yeah. So nature and flowers. Uh, what's your favourite flower? I, oh, I have the, I like I like um, gerbas, and I like dahlias. Okay. I like pins and roses. I like blossom on trees. And I can stand. I don't know the rest of the names of them. I just look at them and go, "That's pretty." Oh, I like that colour. That's exactly how I buy plants. Oh, I like the colour. Oh, I like that. I like that. I have no idea what they're called. Um, I don't think I need to know what they're called. I just oh, like but, what they look like. But well done for doing the word gerber. I like that. That's good. So anything else that ever fails to grab your attention? Because actually flowers and nature does it. But is there something that sounds like that was combined? Is there another thing that never fails to grab your attention? It doesn't have to be. Um, what grabs my attention? Um... Oh, that's a really, that's, do you know what, to have a, I don't, to have a thing, what else grabs my attention? I mean, there are, there are a little sort of material things that grab my attention. Like, well, I'll give you an example if this helps. So in my world, I'm obsessed with ping pong. So if ever I see a table tennis table, that's a, whoo, squirrels, I'll always look at it. 
So, so it's something you know, just out in the world that will make you stop in your tracks. I do like a convertible, Chris. <laughs> okay. I like you. You've got quite elite tastes as well. I like that. Even though you're going to be flying the flag of diversity and inclusivity. I've got one of these. You maybe haven't, but here's my flag of inclusivity and diversity. <laughs> I do like a convertible and I will stop and look at convertible. I really like classic cars, actually. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of a... I wish I could afford to have one, i.e. not that I couldn't afford to buy one, but the upkeep of it and where would you keep it? It's probably, that's the cost. Yes. But um, I really love that sort of classic car, especially a convertible classic car. So that will get me turning, stopping, chatting up the person who's got the car because I just want to have a go. So it's, it's reminding me of, of Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, now fair Hippolyta. And I wooed you with my sword. In your case, I wooed you with my convertible. <laughs> and if you've got a bunch of flowers in there, then you're in. I think it's fantastic. I have a convertible, actually. I'm oh. I do, like I said, yeah, I do. I live by what I say. I I do love it. And I think the thing is, when I <clears throat> you said you couldn't afford one, you lied. Well, you didn't say you no, couldn't no, afford classic, one. No, so no, classic, classic, classic. 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 I couldn't right. afford. No, this isn't the classic one, although it is kind of like old on the old side of cars. It's very old, so it's not a flash car. But I do love it because when it's all shined up, it looks like it's flash. But actually, it's a really old car. Um, but I do love, I do love convertibles, and I love driving even when it's cold and I can wrap up and have the roof off. Oh. I do love it, and that again is that sense. I think we sort of came back to the beginning of being outside and being outside and feeling and looking up and driving. So I'm still connected to the world, but I've still got that that space to just yes. drive. It's very, it's very, it's very soothing. Get a convertible. Love that. It's, it, it, it's old, but it polishes up lovely. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your car. <laughs> 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 Ha, ha, <clears throat> ha. Now, what about one quirky or unusual fact about you that you've been telling us lovely quirky and unusual facts, but what's a, a quirky or unusual fact we couldn't possibly know about you, Michelle Matterson, until you tell us? Mm, quirky. Um, I don't know if there's anything really quirky about me. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything sort of quirky, unusual. Um, you know that when you you sort of alluded to it earlier that I, I did karate and people never normally know that. And that used to be in lots of competitions and like and that, that was a sort of a way of life. I think. I'm sure I remember you coming in your garb a few times. I remember a yellow belt, but maybe you got much more progressed than that. But I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I did. Um, but I think, I think at that point I was going for the England squad and I knocked somebody out so I didn't get in. But I was quoted in combat magazine. Yeah, I think I might have shown you the. Oh, magazine. so they because you knocked somebody out that that made you not get into the team. Was that yeah, right? Actually knocked her out, as in she had to be carried away. Do yeah. you know where she is now? So you can say sorry. Or <laughs> oh, I remember her being really tall. She was from Scotland, and um, we were going for it. Well, she was from Scotland. No, she couldn't have been. She must have been from the north of England, and we were going for um, a place in the um, England squad, and. We were fighting. She had really long legs, so she could really kick, so I had to keep. And at one point, I just thought, I'm going to catch a point. I'm going to be able to get in there with a nice my Gary right into where she is. And um, she dropped her stance, which means that she absolutely came down to my level. So where I was about to punch her in the stomach, her head yeah. was there. Because she just dropped her stance. And I went, <laughs> and you can't see, but I do have. I do have scarring on my knuckles from that event. From that event, still. That's a good. That's a great quirky or unusual fact. Um, by the way, I'm loving the fact that I wait long enough and then it comes <laughs> out. That's really good. So I knock somebody out. That's a quirky thing. I knock somebody out. I knock somebody out. Maybe some teeth. I'm not quite sure, but I knock somebody mm. out. And I do remember being disqualified. I don't. And I was disqualified, but my team were just clapping because I just thought that was a bit unfair. And I'm, getting, get I'm getting two things. I'm getting ungrounded and also don't mess with Michelle as well, which is okay. quite nice. Yeah, that's, she's handy. that's probably always the back of people's minds when they don't quite know. And um, they think, oh, you're very quiet. And it's not quiet, but you're very calm. But, and um, there's power yeah. and poise within. So a bit of a praying mantis, may I say. 
OK, we're going to, um, you're still listening to the Good Listening To podcast. And now what we're going to do is move away from the tree where we've done your 54321. And in the clearing still, we're going to talk about alchemy and gold now. And as I like to also call it, the diamonds beneath our feet. So in your life's purpose, uh, what, what are, you know, what's the alchemy and gold that Michelle Matheson likes to bring? Um, well, you might have to sort of give me a little bit more than that, Chris. The alchemy and gold, what I'd bring. It's the um, purpose of, you know, the inclusivity, the diversity. You've always got people's backs in terms of flying the flag of that. It's, it's just that your life's work and your purpose. I suppose I suppose I have, I have always had other people's backs. I think I've been incredibly supportive. And I think I bring that um, as a natural. I'm very, I suppose it's part of that nurturing and looking after, not looking after, but but caring for, I suppose is, is and, I, and I've always very much um, wanting to ensure that people achieve and do well, which is probably why the teaching works so well. Um, so that, I think that's one of the things I bring. I think I bring laughter and and a little bit of joy. I think that that's really important. Um, it, I think it's important that I feel joyful so it comes out and people think, ah, oh, there's somebody. I, I try very hard to make people feel at ease because I think, and, and be very honest. You know, sometimes I think, just say it as it is. I'm not going to be offended. Just tell me what's on top so we, we can work this through. Um, so I bring that sort of... Sorry to interrupt you. I love that. Say what's on top. I've not heard anyone say it like that before. Yeah, when I worked in a theatre company, we used to have a conch, like in um, uh, it the Lord of the Flies, that would be. Flies. We used to have a conch, a conch shell that we passed around before we began any rehearsals. And you just had to say what was on top. Everyone had to listen. Nobody could comment apart from shaking their head, potentially, or nodding or... Mm -hmm. But that was it. You weren't allowed to say anything. And in doing the on top, it meant everything that had happened, whether it was with your partner, with your children, with work, you just said it. It was out there and then you moved on. And then people could comment once everyone had spoken. I just so also love that that genesis of a theatre strategy then stays with you all your life because just the conscious is a memory you'll never forget. Right. And as a, as a strategy and a technique, say what's yeah. on top and the conch. What a great gift of storytelling that is. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's that's my diamonds and alchemy and gold. No? Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> and then... Um, what we're going to do now, finally, Michelle Matheson, is award you with a cake for gracing us with your presence here on the Good Listening To podcast with me, Chris Grimes. And the cake is also the final storytelling metaphor where you're going to be invited to put a cherry on the cake. Um, you like flowers, you like convertibles. Do you like cake? Just to ask you. I love cake. So you can choose a flavour of cake. It doesn't really matter, but what, what sort of cake are we going for? A, of course, we're going to go for a lemon drizzle. Now it's a bit odd because you're going to put a cherry on your lemon drizzle. I don't mind. Cherries can work on lemon lemon drizzle. And the cherry of the cake is um, how you'd like to leave the legacy of this conversation. This can be a choice or we can do all of this. It's a favourite inspirational quote that's always given you sucker. It could be, what piece of advice, Michelle Matheson, would you give to your younger version of yourself? Or, and if you want to get extra, extra existential on our asses, we can go to, inspired by Shakespeare's All the World's a Stage and All the Men and Women Merely Players, how would you most like to be remembered? What would you like your legacy to be for your children? Um, one of the things that really, one of the quotes um, um, I have that always stays with me is Maya Angelou um, and Still I Rise. And I think that for me, that my mother always said, you never stop learning. Don't think for one minute that you just stop, you never stop learning. And, and that you never stop learning and still I rise means there's always something else. You're still rising. You're not just staying stagnant, you're moving. And I think for me and for my children and my children's children, it's about always rising, always, always um, taking advantage of opportunity, always um, being open. And, and I think that that's a legacy that I would want to leave behind with a smile. I love that. And still I rise in the piece of what you're describing is a lovely reincorporation 
she says, I, I can hear her voice and now you're saying it and still I rise and still I rise. Beautiful. Did I, did I tell you though, that I met Maya Angelou? I was pregnant with my daughter oh. and my eldest daughter and my, my best friend was also pregnant with her daughter. And we were wearing that day, um, really weird, we were wearing white linen, just like white linen trousers or over shirt. And we were quite pregnant then. And we were walking down Camden High Street, almost at Marks and Spencer's, walking down Camden High Street. And she, this really tall woman was walking towards us. And she was with a few other people, but she, I just remember thinking, God, she's tall. And she came towards us. And as she walked through us, she went, my, my, my. And I just thought, that's my Angelou. And we both turned. And that's my Angela, and she was doing some book signing in Camden. Yeah. Oh, I thought yeah. she was saying my, my, my to you. Like It was, no, she was saying it to us. She was saying it to us. She was looking at us and just the both women walking down Camden High Street wow. with, with this sort of white linen. It was a lovely sort of springish summer, it must have been summer day, summer actually, it was summer. And it was, it was just, you know, temperate day and we were walking and talking and she walked in between us. And she just went, my, my, my. Ooh. And you know when you just think, I know that voice? And then she carried on walking and then we stopped and I went, oh my goodness, that's Maya Angelou and turned, but she'd already gone because she was with a little entourage that obviously were trying to get her to this book signing quite quickly. But yeah. By the way, that's such a lovely segue into this idea of your moment in the sunshine. Maya Angelou gave you with her presence a moment in the sunshine. Yeah, wonderful. I love that. Also, um, I happen to know from previous, you know, witterings on Facebook and stuff that you've also stood next to Idris Elba at a certain point as well. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I don't think Idris Elba would know who I am, but I try and get in that photograph with him every now and then. Um, yes. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you meet you meet people and it's really weird. because I think you meet people um, all the time in the sort of line of work that I do. Um, and you become either friends with them or their acquaintances or people that you know. But for example, um, little Daniel Kalula um, used to be the altar boy at a church that I, that I went to. Oh, wow. He was really fat. He was really little. He waddled down with, you know, this long white sort of thing on just and grumpy looking little face. And he then went, ended up at um, sixth form with my daughter's. And, you know, they're, they're good friends. So it's quite funny when I see him and I think, and, you know, once we went to an awards show and he went, oh my God, Pascal Rachel's mom, you know, and it was just really nice to sort of chat to him. Um, you meet people, but the people that make that sort of influence on me is when I was doing um, a radio drama and I had um, Wendy Craig in the studio. Oh, and she was, yes. yeah, she was talking to a young actress at the time who was saying, and you could hear them because we were in the, in, the, in the studio manager's box and you could hear them. And so she said, oh, so I don't recognize you. Um, what, what have you been in? And it's like, oh, and it's, oh well, I'm, I'm Wendy Craig and um, I've been in something called Butterflies. And she just went, Oh no, I don't know that. And we were just like, oh my God, sacrilege. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, I think sometimes it's the people that you grew up with watching on screen that have the most impact, the yes. most impact, because they are the ones that um, really, you really, and I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's true of my children. They came, they were um, camera school for girls and they had to do a sort of talk to famous people mm -hmm. moment. And um they were waiting in the sort of donuts for famous people to walk past so that they could grab them. So Michael Parkinson walked past and I said, that's Michael Parkinson. You don't need grab to him. him. He's yeah. really famous. And they said, no, I don't know who he is. But one of the older six form girls said, oh, I think I recognize him. I'll go and talk to him. So she went to speak, speak to him. And then the next minute there was just, oh my God, it's Tracy Beaker. <laughs> and that poor girl who was with her chaperone was then mobbed by about 20 girls, just going, oh my God, Tracy Beaker, Tracy Beaker. And the chaperone was so shocked. She said, no one ever recognizes us. We walk around the BBC, no one ever recognizes us. And these girls just mobbed them. And I just thought that that was really, when when people mean something to you, when, when you've yes. grown up with them, seeing them on screen, they mean much more to you than maybe people that you 
you know, who are incredibly famous. Yes. Because you just have to pretend that you don't really know that they're really famous if you it's kind of well, that's made me think of two things you know the the barbara windsor biopic that happened recently did you see the story of that or did you see it where she met joan littlewood the great theater yes. director because joan littlewood was sweeping the yard so yes. barbara windsor talked to her as if she was just you know obviously just yes. cleaning the, the yard which is obviously an important thing to do but because of that dropped her guard and was totally authentic therefore had the job before she walked into absolutely. the audition absolutely hence be yourself because everyone else is taken is a great quote and and by the way it reminds me our time at central school of screech and trauma at royal at time do you remember that uh, gerard and i shared a flat with uh colin firth's sister kate firth yes colin firth is someone that i you know if i was to bump into colin firth in the street today he'd say who are you then i'd (laughs) tell him but he would agree that i'd met him hurrah (laughs) well you know it's funny you know we went to edinburgh and did a um in balm and gilead and I do remember it was myself, Amy, and um, uh, M- M- oh, names Mariah right. Carey. No, <laughs> Mariah Carey. Um, anyway, it'll come back to me in a second. And um, we had to do we had to do the singing to get people to come to the show, and that we ended up being bigger than the show because the singing kind of took off. So Jason Isaacs was the manager, and um, uh, two guys were in the band. We were an a cappella band. I remember and, Jason Isaacs as well from the acting course when we were there. Yes, yes, yes. And it was just really funny. But, you know, I remember walking around with Stephen Tompkinson trying to hand out flyers to people. I remember him too. Brain. So I was working at ITV. I walked one day and I saw him and I said, oh, that's Stephen Tompkinson. And my friends, you don't know him. I said, I went to Central with him. She said, oh, well, you know. And I said, Stephen. And he looked across and he went, Oh my God, Central School of Speech and Drama. And yeah, yeah. that was, for me, was just, and we clicked, and that was just like, yes. So no, he, he's really charming as well. I met him in London. I literally walked into him in Oxford Street. But what was funny about him, he remembered me. He said, hi, Chris. It was a good exchange. Yeah. But he did what was um, really funny. You know, when someone does a pull through, when you shake hands with them and they pull you through. So I remember being sort of ejected on the <laughs> other side of him going, right, that's obviously over then. <laughs> and he's gone. <laughs> He was obviously late for an audition. I, I think he's really charming because there was a, round about the time we were pregnant with my daughter Lily, there was one other reunion at Central and I went back and, and Stephen Tompkins and Jared and I were sitting there. Mm-hmm. And do you remember there was, a, um, in terms of who succeeds us, you know, in, in generations of being at college, you see people who remind you of other people. Do you remember there was um, one of the, uh, the, one of the participants, do you remember Amy? She was a black uh, teacher who was, I think the year yeah. behind us, she was there too. I'm just going down memory lane. Well, Amy was in the band. So it was Amy, Mina. Um, I mean, Amy, um, his daughter, Zakia, um, oh. worked at um, Somerset House. Zakia, I got Zakia in to have her own um, spot on one of the desks there so that she could do her business, which is radio and um, and writing. So which is Yeah, yeah. Um, Amy, we spoke on the phone and FaceTime, so that was really lovely to see. Are you still in touch with Amy? Yes, yes. You say hello from me. I will, I, I'll link you actually. And um, Mina, you know, unfortunately lost both her daughters. Oh terrible. my God, that was an extraordinary story last year. I couldn't believe yeah. that. So Good that grief. was incredibly sad. Um, and I couldn't believe it, but when I saw in the news the, the daughter's name, I thought there's only one person who had the daughter that night, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, and because yeah, we're still recording, by the way, we might need to just position what that is, that story. Yeah. Oh, um, well, I think her daughters were out on the birthday in the park. They were with friends, and then it just ended up being her two daughters, and somebody came and killed them both. And it was just, just, just unbelievable. And... And I don't know whether they caught the person who did it, um, but it was just one of those things where you just think how that must the pain. And her mum, and Mina by then had been, um, I don't want to say bishop, but she was quite high up in the church, in Church mm-hmm. of England. So um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not in contact with Mina, but I just remember um, her, she had a daughter when she was at Central. So it was, um, yeah, really, really, really sad, actually. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't see many central people. I think I saw, um, she was she was in the Desert Island thing with Oliver Reed. What's her name, the actress? Oh. Uh, I've got her, her face is in my mind. And then she was, in, she was a lawyer in some, uh, yes. like LA Law, I think it was called. 
Amanda Donahue. Amanda Donahue. Yes, exactly. So Amanda Donahue, I saw. I was. She was in the petrol station as I was walking with my children. One on strapped on front and one in a buggy, feeling incredibly frumpy and depressed at the time. And she was in there with her slicked hair and this open top Wrangler Jeep. And I saw her and I knew she would recognize me. But I turned around. Oh. I turned around and went home. And it was that feeling of, look, her life is so amazing. And look where I am, you know, with two children. And, you know, you know that sort of feeling because it's. Yes. Do you know what? You're reminding me at one of our reunions. I remember you telling this story. It was really, yeah. really poignant yeah. about the idea that, you know, we keep need to keep hold of the fact that success is relative. Success is very relative because obviously yeah. when I did see her, um, with one of the other girls from the acting course, Smoon Bars, you know, she was all over my children because I don't think she managed to have children of her own or or whether yeah. she wanted to, but um, she was just all over my chain to me how lucky I was to have these yeah, two yeah. girls. And I just thought, gosh, you wouldn't really... I couldn't say, oh, I saw you when they were really, really young. I just had to accept it and say yes. And, and that stuck in my mind as one of those yeah, things yeah. you can't always... Um, you know what what like you said what looks successful isn't always and what yes. is, you know it's a it's all relative isn't it it is Michelle Matheson it's been such a joy talking to you you've brought such grace and groundedness and presence and there is such a sort of matriarchal quality to how you're running your career to nurture those that are coming in your wake or those that are next almost like next generation which is what Jason Isaacs is up to now isn't he he's doing some stuff <laughs> tricky thing but anyway um is there anything else you'd like to say with your moment in the sunshine you know where can we find out more about Michelle Matheson on the internet if we want to oh I don't know I think I think people Google you. The first time Lenny Henry said, I Googled you, it shocked me because I didn't think that's what people did, but that's what people do. Um, You've been Googled by Lenny Henry. That's a great Googled last Googled moment. Me. That's um, another quirky or unusual fact, by the way. I've been Googled by Lenny Henry because I don't think I have, actually. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're good. He's a good guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I just... I, I, is there any other thing in the sunshine? I think um, it's just... It's just enjoying the moment, enjoying being present. I think that's the whole thing about being present, being hopeful. Um, and, you know, um, that's, that's all we can do, really, is be present, be hopeful. And still I rise. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the lovely, the wonderful Michelle Matheson here on the Good Listening To podcast with me, Chris Grimes. And good night. <laughs>